Yeah, good morning. Delighted to get an opportunity to talk to you today about offshore wind. Uh, really, it's a very exciting uh, space internationally. Stephen mentioned it there in, uh, in his talk. There's been huge developments over the last uh, number of years in the space. And indeed, in the last 12, 18 months, there's been a significant uptick in the level of interest in offshore wind in Ireland. And, and we've seen that uh, within Airgrid. There's really two things I want to talk to you about this morning. First of all, I want to give a sense of the different delivery frameworks that are out there uh, across Europe and the US. Really, Europe is, is, the, is the world leader in offshore wind. And also, I want to give a summary of the East Coast study. So that's a study that Airgrid published in the last week or so, which spoke about or pointed out uh, the capacity available along the, along the East Coast of Ireland. And I'm going to specifically focus in on offshore wind. So, what, like, why are we here? Like, over the last number of uh, over the last number of years, particularly the last two years, uh, we've seen rapidly decreasing costs in offshore wind. And Stephen mentioned a lot of this. I suppose looking back a number of years, offshore wind was expensive because construction risks were high, operational risks were high, and also the environment that offshore wind uh, farms were built is challenging. But, the, but it has improved a lot over the last number of years. The technology has significantly matured. And now probably the main risk uh, that remains is the weather-related or the uh, kind of the harsh environment-related risks. But that's meant that prices have dropped very significantly. And I've just taken there a selection of prices from different uh, support auctions in Europe. And over the last, particularly about 18 months ago, that's when they really started to drop. There was a sudden, sudden drop in the outcome of those auctions. And like Stephen mentioned there earlier on, the projection is that that will continue. So at the moment, it's about eight, nine megawatt, megawatts is the largest offshore uh, turbines that are in place. We expect, like SSE, that by the middle of the next decade, we'll see up to 15 megawatt turbines in place. There's a number of different delivery models for offshore wind internationally. And if you see there the graphic on the right, like an offshore wind at its very, very simplest con uh, uh, consists of three things. You've got the grid connection, which is shown in red. You've got the wind, wind turbines themselves, which are shown in black. And then you've got the, the permitting for the, uh, for the offshore wind farm. The two different models have evolved uh, and, and they split that out in different ways, how that's delivered. So what's commonly called a centralized model is in place in Denmark and the Netherlands. And that's effectively that the TSO would build the transmission connection and carry out the necessary permitting, and the developer would build the wind farm. The decentralized model is a, a model that's been a, a has been rolled out very successfully within Great Britain, and indeed looks like it's going to be also off the east coast of the US. And here, the developer does everything, really. They build the transmission, they carry out the permitting, and they build the offshore wind farm itself. Now, at a high-level comparison between the two different models, well, the centralized model, it's really a plan-led model. The state decides where the offshore wind uh, farm should be built, uh, when it will be built, and it takes a very proactive role in the delivery of offshore uh, infrastructure. The key advantages, according to industry an analysts of that approach, are it's a wider investor pool given the, and I have an in inverted commas, the simplicity. So really, by the state building the grid connection, it's seen to simplify uh, the complexity of the project, thus attracting a wider investment uh, pool with a view to driving down costs. And there's also the sense that it facilitates optimum development of transmission at the transmission network offshore. And that reflects the fact that, look, there's only a discrete number of landing points uh, along, along, along any coastline, really. And then you have the decentralized model. And as I mentioned, that's very much a developer-led approach. So the developer decides where is the optimum location to build an offshore wind farm and really, and really drives the agenda forward. And the key advantages of that approach is are there's developers, there's, there's niche developers that are out there that are experienced at doing this, and perhaps they're more adept at identifying what are the very best sites for offshore wind. And also, the developer in this approach, it's less prescriptive, there's more uh, size and project, or site and project size flexibility associated with this particular approach. 
So really, I suppose in Ireland, we, we do have the, the benefit of looking at these quite well-developed models internationally and seeing what's the right fit for Ireland. The second thing I wanted to talk about was the East Coast study. And as I said, this is a report that we published, I think it was late last week, and it speaks about what are the, what's the capacity available for large offshore uh, wind farms off the east coast of Ireland. And we specifically looked at the east coast because that's where the feedback we were getting from the industry, that's where people specifically wanted to know what was the capacity available. And as we all know, over the last probably four or five years, there's been a very a significant growth in demand uh, off the, uh, look in the Dublin area, primarily driven by data centres. So the East Coast study, it actually looked at three different things. It looked at the capacity for offshore wind. It also looked at spare bays that were available in the different stations that were looked uh, along the East Coast. And it also looked at the capacity for thermal generation. So up to 450 megawatts of thermal generation was looked at at each of these different nodes along the East Coast. So effectively, we took nine different locations, three north of Dublin, three within Dublin, and three south of Dublin, and looked at the capacity and spare bays available in each of those stations. But look, I'm gonna focus on, on, the, on the capacity for offshore wind here this morning. The report is on the website, and look, it goes into, it goes into a fair amount of detail uh, to kind of supplement what I'm saying. So how did we do it specifically for offshore wind? At its simplest, we added at each of those nine different locations, we looked at each of them in isolation. It's important to make that point. We weren't looking at it cumulatively. We looked at each of them in isolation. But at each node, we would have added 800 megawatts of, of offshore wind. And then we would reduce the 800 megawatts in the overall model to make it balance. And effectively, we took off the most expensive uh, thermal generation to make, the, to make the case balance, to make the study balance. And then we carried out our power systems analysis study, found where there was constraints, and then see, uh, found eff effectively the natural limit at each of those dis different locations, and also investigated uh, potential reinforcements to get up to 800 megawatts. Why did we pick 800 megawatts? Look, uh, from uh, looking at uh, jurisdictions uh, similar to Ireland, so for example, um, Denmark in particular, seven, 800 megawatts seems to be about a, st a standard size of an offshore wind farm. So looking specifically then at the opportunities north of Dublin. So we looked at Loud uh, to 20 kV station, which is a very big station uh, just outside Dundalk. Uh, we looked at Oriel, that's um, a conceptual uh, station which reflects the fact that there is a, a gay tree uh, Oriel wind farm. And finally, Woodland, it's a 400 kV station just north of Dublin. And you can see here, the closer you are to Dublin, the greater the capacity available. So in Loud, there's 450 megawatts available effectively right now. With fairly significant reinforcement, it could be brought up to 650 and potentially 800 megawatts. Oriel, very, very similar picture. It's electrically very, very close to loud. But Woodland, Woodland is an extremely strong node on the transmission network. And it was found that 800 megawatts is available uh, in Woodland 400 kV station. Looking at Looking at Dublin itself, so we looked at three stations in Dublin, Finglas and Poolbeg. We split Poolbeg in two, and that reflects the fact that we operate Poolbeg effectively as a split station uh, today, uh, and that allows us to operate the network in Dublin in the most effective uh, and uh, efficient manner. So in Finglas and Poolbeg North and Poolbeg South, look, I, I guess the theme really here is there is good capacity available at all of those locations. And that makes sense. You're right beside the major load centers. And then looking at opportunities south of Dublin. So we looked at Carrick Mines through 20 kV station, which is just off the M50 in South Dublin. We looked at Ballybeg. That's currently a 110 kV station, but we effectively looked at, well, if that was operated up to 220 kV, uh, and we, we, we there's actually a circuit going between Arklo and Carrick Mines, which is uh, built to 220 kV standard, but operated at 110. 
So we said, okay, what happens if Bally Beg was uh, changed into a 220 kV station? And then finally, we looked at Arklow 220 kV station just outside Arklow town. And again, the, the, the picture is quite similar. The closer you are to Dublin, the higher the capacity that's available. So in Carrick Mines, 650 is there. Uh, if we put in a new circuit between Carrick Mines and Pool Beg, we get that up to the 800. Bally Beg, there's 500 available. Uh, again, it's assuming that it's operated at 220 and we have 220 kV overhead lines in and around there. And with uprates, we can get it up to 700. Arklow, similarly, similar numbers. Uh, there's 350 there in the, exi the existing network, and we can get it up to 800 if we up voltage uh, and operate uh, 220 kV circuits from Arklow into North Dublin. So just a brief summary of the capacity, really. Um, and again, it's a, it's, it's a common theme. Within Dublin, we can get the 800 megawatts. Uh, looking at North and South Dublin, the closer you are to Dublin, the more capacity that's available uh, right now. So look, I think uh, Stephen mentioned it there, there's going to be, and I think it came up a lot, quite, uh, quite a lot there ye uh, yesterday as well, we're going to need a lot more renewables in the context of 2030. I just have a, a graphic here which shows tomorrow energy scenarios from 2017. So focusing specifically on offshore wind, it shows up to three gigawatts of offshore wind. Uh, we're updating these, number at the, these numbers at the moment. We'll be publishing tomorrow's energy scenarios 2019, and it will be interesting to see how, do, how these numbers evolve, and we'll be seeking your feedback on that. There's a number of different models available to deliver offshore wind. These are big projects, and there are some, I suppose, good established frameworks there from which Ireland can learn from. And finally, the East Coast study, there is significant capacity available uh, for offshore wind off the East Coast of Ireland. That's it. Thank you.